If we retrace our steps, we can still feel it all. Pride. Pure joy. And the ultimate risk. Love and respect. Shocking the world. <laughs> showing out. She is a baller. All for that sweet confetti feeling. When you step into the greatness of this moment, you'll feel it too. March Madness. Feel it here. Hype. I don't know what exactly gets you hype. Welcome to Women's Tourney Tip Off Live, presented by Invesco QQQ, Christine Williamson, Tarika Foster, Alexa Philippou. We are here in studio and we're going to get you set for the women's tournament. And there's a lot to get to, women. But first, I want to say hello. Congratulations Hi. for being here. Hey. Welcome. It's so good to have you guys in studio. We're excited. We're excited. Yeah. Super excited. Yes, yeah. yes it's going to be really good. Um, so the madness has already begun, right? Uh, you guys have a lot to look forward to. What are you looking forward to most in this tournament, Alexa? Well, I think one of the things that stuck out to me at the be and during the regular season was that we've seen, to be honest, some inconsistency. Right. There's some days that teams look like uh, they can win the national title. There's others where they just seem like, uh, you know, maybe not. So I want to see when the everything is on the line, mm -hmm. when it's the – under the bright lights, right. who's going to be ready for that moment? Who's going to be able to execute down the stretch? And I don't know if we fully know that yet. I think it's, it's more open than maybe a lot of us think. Yeah. So that's what I'll be looking at. Who's playing their best basketball in March? Be quickly. I'm looking for upsets. Last year, we had an abundance of upsets in the first uh -huh. round. I think we'll get a couple this year, too. Oh, it'll be great. It'll be great. We love That's what makes March the madness. And officially, by the way, March Madness is officially part of the women's game this season, so we can officially call it March Madness, and we love to see that. So, as I said, it's already begun today. Four games in progress, and we are going to start with South Florida versus Miami. I went to Miami, so I know who I want to win this game. <laughs> Miami won eight of their last ten games, and they start the thing with USS Betty Kuminga. Munanga, excuse me. Uh, and take another look. This girl cannot be stopped down in the paint. She's seriously balling. And honestly, I think that that's something that we probably expected a little bit. But then again, it's Miami. They're going to do what they do best. And it's crazy <laughs> Miami hurricane. And USF went back and forth in this game. Did you expect them to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in this one? Yeah, they're both really good teams, um, both from good conferences. I think Miami, we knew that they could pull it out after we saw what they were able to do in the ACC tournament. So Miami wins that one 78 to 66. I personally am very happy about that. Also want to shout out Miami for beating Louisville early in the season. Oh. All right. <laughs> So, ladies, let's <laughs> dig into the tournament a little bit and just start at the top. Uh, when it comes to South Carolina, everybody knew that this was the best team in the country, right? They're a one seed. Is there a team that can stop South Carolina? Well, honestly, the only team that can stop South Carolina is South Carolina, right? For the most part, they have been um, inconsistent in ways that has only been up to them to fix. And so they can absolutely make those transitions. But I think, though, when I look at the Greensboro region as a whole, the one team that stands out to me is Iowa State. Um, they're coming into this tournament as a three seed. The 25 wins that they have this year is a single season record for this institution. And listen, Ashley Jones is a bucket, y'all. Like, she really can score the basketball out here. So when I think about that, I think about those inconsistencies from right. South Carolina. I have to wonder, you know, if they get past Iowa, which is a team that they have defeated already once this year. Right. So they know how to play Iowa. If they get past them, hey, they're going to be confident going into a potential Elite Eight matchup against South Carolina. Yeah. I, I totally agree with what Tariqa was saying about South Carolina having to fix its kind of own flaws. But I also have my eyes on a potential Final Four matchup mm -hmm. between – South Carolina and Baylor, because I think if you watch the Big 12 tournament, like most mm -hmm. people like did not want to play that version of Baylor. They did ultimately lose in the final to Texas, but that's a really good Texas team at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know what Baylor 
is, even though they have new leadership at the helm, um, Nikki right. Collin obviously took over, yeah. but Nalissa Smith is an absolute baller. She's been playing some of her best basketball down the stretch. And I think whenever you have a player like that, kind of a national player of the year caliber player, that could pose a lot of problems for no matter who you're facing. Um, and Baylor shoots the three this year. So that, again, is a potential uh -huh. matchup, uh, I don't say problem, but matchup kind of you wouldn't want to look at if uh, South Carolina and Baylor were to meet up. So that would be a really intriguing matchup to me. So like you mentioned, that would be in the final four. That's a long ways away. Mm -hmm. yes. When you look at the one seeds right now, which one do you think is more likely to lose first? Uh, I know Jeff Walsh just signed this good contract, <laughs> but I'm going to roll with Louisville. Um, I think it's fair to say that majority of us thought that Louisville would be a team that would eventually sit at the two seed because Baylor was a team that I think we all projected, but unfortunately they were unable to close the deal against Texas um, in the Big 12 tournament. So because of that, Louisville was able to continue to stay on top with that one seed. But this conference, in my old well, conference, this region is a bit stacked. So even right. if Baylor, per se, doesn't make it, let's just say they fall out for whatever reason. They're still Michigan. They're still Oregon. They're still Tennessee. They all could match up against that elite Louisville defense. And it's elite, y'all. Yep. I mean, it's an elite defense, right? So um, I think that at the end of the day, though, it will be Baylor that they will potentially see. And I think, as you just mentioned, Alyssa Smith is a bucket walking, 24 double-doubles. She's going to show why she's potentially the number one WNBA draft pick. So, sorry, Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the things that has stuck out to me about Louisville is that they've given up some really big leads late in games multiple times this season. And we saw it with the Miami game, which I'm sure you were very <laughs> pleased to see. But they were up by 15 with five minutes to play and then were outscored 17-0 down the stretch and lost on a buzzer beater. So we, that's bad enough to right. think that happens in the ACC tournament quarterfinals. But then you kind of rewind the clock a little bit, and th the same thing basically happened. It was actually probably even worse against NC State when Louisville played them in January. So this is a little bit of a pattern for Louisville that they haven't been able to close out close games. And that's probably the most important thing that you need to do in right. March. So, again, as I talked about at the top of the show, how are these teams going to come out when it matters most? That's the one, number one thing I'm looking at for Louisville to, to show. They have to be resilient when, you know, they have to close out games and, and get those Ws. Listen, um, if you guys don't know this about me already, I I talk about Miami any possible time <laughs> that I can talk about Miami, but I'll stop talking about Miami now because <laughs> we've, we've officially closed that door. Okay, so Alexa, <laughs> when you look at these, this whole entire, um, the whole entire tournament, we talked about Louisville. Which team would you think, out of all of the teams, is overseeded? Yeah, so that was actually, we were talking about this before, not to really... Uh, to pick in. on Louisville <laughs> yeah, yeah. that much. Of course, this is going to end up on their, like, you know, we're yes, 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 it's Louisville. So they need a little fuel to the fire. fire. Exactly. No, but I, I, let me phrase it as this. I think it was interesting because the the committee that kind of seeded the tournaments and got the brackets right. situated, they seem to really want to pay attention to uh, which teams are playing their best basketball at the end of the season. That was going to matter more. So based off that criteria, I thought that maybe Baylor was going to get the edge there because, again, Louisville lost in the ACC tournament quarterfinals. They had also lost in mid-February to UNC, which isn't a horrible loss, but it's still probably not great. Yeah. Baylor had won, uh, they actually have won 17 of their last 19 games. So I thought even with a really, you know, again, not a bad loss to Texas in the final of their conference tournament, maybe they would have gotten the edge mm -hmm. um, over Louisville. I think that was one of the surprises or um, just kind of things up in the air in the bracket. But yeah. at the end of the day, any probably team's going to say it doesn't matter where you're seated. That's you exactly. just got to win games. Exactly. You have to win games if you want to win the championship. Uh, T, I'm going to ask you the opposite side of this question. <laughs> Who do you feel like was underseated in the <sighs> tournament? So I, I promised myself that I wasn't going to go on a soapbox, but I'm kind of going to go on a soapbox. <laughs> um, I am going to say that I think Jacksonville, uh, Jacksonville, I think Jackson State University uh -huh. was underseated. They are the SWAC champions. Now, when people usually think of the team that has won the most games in a row, it actually is not Stanford. It is Jackson State. They are on a 21-game win streak. Again, longest win streak in the country. Amisha williams Holiday, ninth in the country in block shots. She was the SWAT player of the year, defensive player of the year for that conference, and they're seeded 14. Now, last year they were able to get into the tournament, but they were also at a 15 seed having to play Baylor, who was coached by Kim Mulkey. Well, guess who they play this year? 
LSU. Oh my God, Guess who's the coach of LSU? <laughs> that is Malky. Just like, what are we doing here? So I think that it's just a little bit unfair that you have teams who have literally gone through the gauntlet, gone through their conference, worked extremely hard to get to the NCAA tournament, but we don't really get to see them shine in their element because they're out so quickly because we have the matching up against like juggernauts. Right. I think I think Jackson State was good enough to at least be a ten a, a ten seed. Yeah. Um, let's give them an opportunity to really play and really shine. They deserve it. I love that. I love that so much. Don't stop putting the girls at the bottom. You know they deserve I mean? to be at the top. Twenty one game win streak. That's significant. What? Right? That should have gone into the seating. I don't sure. know if I could do anything twenty one times in a row. <laughs> Yeah, no, not me, either. <laughs> not me either. Okay, I'm out. <laughs> um, knowing that, obviously, Jackson State, you're saying, is is underseeded. Which five seed or lower do you feel like can go deep in the tourney? Alexa, we'll start with you. I'm very much on the record of being on the IUPUI bandwagon. Don't even ask me where that school is. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I think that they can make some noise. Um, if you look at the matchups, I mean, they are going to play Oklahoma in the first round. I think that's going to be a really tough game for Oklahoma. Uh -huh. IUPUI has a 6-2-4 in Macy Williams, four-time Horizon League Player of the Year. Uh, she can go off on them, and we know Oklahoma has some issues guarding um, some of the tougher post players or post presence in the country. Uh, in addition, IUPUI has really good three-point uh, field goal percentage defense. And again, we think about a team like Oklahoma, that's one of their strengths. So I'm curious to see how they can try and contain a team like Oklahoma from the three-point line. And if you're asking, why is Alexa so on this IUPUI train? Question. Let me tell you this. They beat Iowa at the beginning of the season. Uh-huh. And... They took Michigan to overtime. So they've had these really high-level games that they played against, and they've really excelled in them. Uh -huh. So I think they're going to come in ready to play. I have them going to the Sweet 16, which maybe is oh, a little okay. aggressive, but okay. I gonna, was ready for nothing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just let you know it's in Indianapolis, Indiana. Just FYI. Oh. <laughs> I probably should have, like, thought about that. Like, the, yeah. There we go. <laughs> See, who do you think? Um, I am high on Florida Gulf Coast, and – you know, maybe they just have us. I have a soft spot for them. This is their fourth consecutive time being in the tournament. They lead the country in three points attempted, second in the nation in three points made. So to say that they have some offensive firepower is kind of an understatement. Like, this is a team that takes care of the basketball really well. And again, they're led by Kirsten Bell, who, from what I've been seeing, because they're playing right now, hasn't been as dominant as she is, and yet they're still hanging in there, right? So I think that this is a team that could really be motivated. She's already declared for the WNBA draft. So this could be like that extra push where it's like, this is my only opportunity. Right. Let's get the Cinderella. Let's bring up the glass slippers. This could be that team. So I'm going to roll with Florida Gulf Coast. Also, no pressure. Do you remember when FGCU went on a run on the men's tournament? I do. They were a 15 seed, and they went to like the exactly, yeah. Exactly. So, so they could do this on the women's side also. Um, let's go deeper into the Greensboro bracket because I know a lot of people are very excited about a potential matchup that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. South Carolina versus Iowa. You get Aaliyah Boston, Caitlin Clark going up against one another. How excited are you about, I like to say this a lot, just make sure we're underlying, potential, <laughs> the potential matchup between Clark and Boston. This is absolutely the matchup that I think everyone wants to hear because this is the matchup that could settle the National Player of the Year conversation. If you're someone who has a vote, if you're someone who's on the fence, I don't know why you would be, but if you're that person, this is that potential matchup that could do it. Kaylin Clark is a, is a prolific scorer, okay? She's the NCAA's best, 27.4 points per game, but this Hawkeyes team revolves around her, which is why she leads in so many different statistical categories. But on the opposite side of that bracket, Aaliyah Boston, A, B, mm -hmm. the most dominant player that we have in college basketball. Right. And I'm saying college basketball, not men's, not women's, oh, yeah. period, okay? She runs it, and because of that, the team – absolutely does so many things well because of how powerful and how dominant that she is. And I think that this is a matchup that people are going to look at, even though they don't play each other, yeah. even though they don't play the same right. positions. I just think that because of the hype around this game, each team is going to come out hot and it's going to come down to which player can absolutely dominate the game right. in the closest moments. Alexa? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more there. I think it's going to be interesting to see, too, how South Carolina tries to slow her down. So I would expect Bria Beal to be the pr primary defender on her. She usually takes the opposing team's best um, perimeter defend or perimeter player to defend. Um, and really to try and slow down Caitlin, there's only so much you can do, I feel like, 
but you have to stop her in transition. You can't let her get going that way. You have to try, again, so much you can do. You have to try and slow her down and contest those threes. You can't let her get, her, get comfortable from beyond the arc. Try and play her physical. Try and play her tough. I thought um, Nicole Condrano Hillary from Indiana did a really good job against mm -hmm. her in the Big Ten tournament. Um, and they tried to actually say, okay, we're going to try and take as much as we can away from Caitlin. And who else on Indi or in Iowa is going to beat you? And that was uh, Monica Cezano. So they do have that option. But, you know, Caitlin's who makes the – what's it? The, the straw that makes everything – the, 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 that stirs the cup or, you know, <laughs> the, the phrase. So. It's, it's basically like, going to come down – it's basically going to come down to am I going to beat you from shooting from the logo or am I going to beat you from True. pounding you exactly. inside? Exactly. Like, that's what that's it is. That's going to be a good matchup. Since we're on the conversation of the best women's basketball players in the country, it's now time – it is now time to choose wisely presented by Wendy's and the finalists for the Wooden Award were announced. Here's a list of the 15 finalists on the women's side. Aaliyah Boston and Caitlin Clark are obviously on that list. T, uh, who do you think? <laughs> I, I feel like we know because we already heard her screaming from the rooftop. <laughs> okay. Who do you think should win the award this season? Well, I got to say, I really do love Angel Reese at Maryland. However, I am going Aaliyah Boston. No surprise here, guys. Again, she's been the best player in college basketball all year long. She's a top scorer, top rebounder for South Carolina. She's helped her team remain number one all season long. She leads the game, cuts in 82 blocks, 40 steals. She's consistent. She's my wooden award winner. Alexa? I mean, she's my pick, too. So <laughs> I'm about to talk about Caitlin Clark, but I want to put that out there because I don't want anyone coming after me. No, I think Aaliyah Boston does deserve it. But we can't not talk about Caitlin Clark in this conversation. I mean, she is on track to become the first player in NCAA Division I women's basketball to lead the nation in both scoring and assists. And that's only happened once on the men's side. Cy Young did it in 2017 and 2018. So I think you can't say enough about how she is just, again, a walking bucket. She's able to do so many different things on the court. But at the same time, she's elevated this Iowa program to a number two seed in the tournament. And they went on this crazy run at the end of the season. I think maybe her play was a little bit more inconsistent at the beginning of the season, but she's got it kind of going on now late. All right, all of you guys can vote as well by going to www.wendys.com slash wooden awards vote. All right, uh, so there's some games going on literally right now, and this game... <sighs> oh, Howard. <sighs> I mean, we're so happy that they showed up for the game. <laughs> this, and they did what they could, uh, but it just it wasn't really a ball I, game. I just think this speaks more to my point of give them give HBCUs and other smaller conferences better That's seating. True. Like, this is a great team. This is the first time you're appearing in a tournament. This is a great team. This is a very unfortunate sport. It's though. just an unfortunate situation. So South Carolina up by 60. Uh, that's live right now. Looking like Howard is obviously not going to get back in that one. But like I said, we are so happy that they made it to the tournament. We are. Great season. Great season. And they won their game Wednesday. So they did come away with a win. So not all hope is lost. Yeah, yeah. That's good. <laughs> All right, everybody. So, listen, the Pac-12 came out and made a statement this year. They've got six teams representing in the NCAA tournament, including the Spokane region number one seed in the Stanford Cardinal. And so joining us, we have a former Stanford Cardinal in Roz <laughs> golden Wood joining us today. Hey, Roz. Hey, what's up, ladies? First of all, I am thrilled. We love to see it, this show, this tip-off. And um, I'm excited to work with y'all. And thank you for having me. Well, look. I'm excited that you're here because you are who I look to when it comes to Pac-12. And so let's go ahead and just go get right into it with Stanford. They're number one seed. They are leading the Spokane region. They have absolutely done a phenomenal job getting back to this point. Tell us, do they have what it takes to repeat and what do they need to do in order to come out champions again? I think they've been doing what it takes all season. They were already talented and they improved. What what makes me uh, bullish on Stanford's chances to repeat the championship is their depth. Um, they just have so many ways to hurt you. Their depth of players. I mean, we're going to look at Haley Jones, the Pac-12 player of the year or the defensive player of the year, Cameron Brink. We knew that they were great players. Haley Jones, anytime she's on the court, has a mismatch. It's more about Tara Vanderveer figuring out 
which way she uses all of the versatility Haley Jones has on offense. Cameron Brink, I think, gives Stanford a nice fire and, and toughness about her and absolutely anchors them with her shot blocking ability on the defensive end. Uh, this is a Stanford team that can play inside, they can play outside, they play offense well, they play defense well, they share the ball. They're physical, they're tough. Um, and I want to point out the growth of three players that Tara likes to call the Washington triplets. That includes the uh, the Hull twins and Lexi and Lacey and Anna Wilson. When you know Stanford graduated Kiana Williams, there was an adjustment period. And those three guards Tara now can really lean on for uh, leadership, hard work, setting the tone, dependability. Um, she calls them winners. She calls them the engine, the motor. And th they really anchor the defensive and offensive side of Stanford's backcourt. Um, shout out to Fran Belibi, too. Another example of, hey, if somebody's down, somebody else is ready to go for Stanford. Um, Haley Jones was out, and Fran Belibi came in and was unstoppable. So they just have, there's so many stories like that on their roster. They're very deep and very good. And I think, too, with Stanford, they can shoot the three. We saw that last year in the tournament. And whenever you have three-point shooters multiple at that, then you have a really good chance of making it far in March. Absolutely. Oh, I completely agree. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad you brought up Haley Jones, too, because I think in the beginning of the season, we had a little bit of a, a time trying to figure out if she could figure out where she fit in into this offense. And now she's absolutely moving. Uh, so outside of Stanford, there are five other teams and two teams that stand out is Arizona and Oregon. So when we look at what they have done thus far, uh, Roz, do you feel like these two are two teams that could make a deep run in the tournament or how far exactly would you see them going? I could see them making a deep run for sure. I just finished covering the women's Pac-12 tournament out in Vegas. I mean, Arizona one has been there before, made it all the way to the championship. Um, they have a number of players returning. They have a strong defensive identity and Sam Thomas is the anchor for that. Um, this is a team that Coach Barnes will make sure, will make you uncomfortable, they'll turn you over, they'll muck up the game. And when you have a strong defensive identity, I think you have a chance to shake things up in the tournament. Also of note, Kate Reese is back. That's points, that's rebounds, that's their star, their leader, their consistency, their toughness. She was not playing during the Pac-12 tournament, which was a big part of their exit. And just real quick for Oregon, I think they're one of the most dangerous teams, guys, in the tournament. Because Oregon, on you just don't know which version you're gonna get. At their best, they've beaten UConn, they've beaten Arizona, you know, but at their worst, they've been incons inconsistent and up and down. But look to their size, Niara Sabli or Sedona Prince going high-low with each other. They've actually been consistent on the defensive end, but the X factor for them will be their guard play. Can Sahina Pow Pow or India Rogers get it going? Before we let you go, Rob, we started this segment with you being a Stanford Cardinal yourself. And so you know what it's like to be in these situations. You've got to share with us what does it feel like to be in a March Madness type scenario? Wow. You know, to this day, it's March Madness. The final fours I've been to uh, still present some of the most thrilling times of my life. You know, one, if, if it's especially your first time, uh, especially to a Final Four. It just feels so big. Um, all the different fans in the arena, you're playing in front of tens of thousands. Of, and that's an exciting part too. We're back in a big way with fans since the pandemic. Um, you know, small things as a player, like the charge of all the hard work paying off to get to this really tough moment, to be somewhere that a lot of teams don't ever get to experience. Damn, I was doing a whole lot of talking in the pregame <laughs> huddle. <laughs> you was lit, you was lit in the huddle, you was lit. <laughs> I was, I was that one. I was hyping people up. But um, one thing, you know, I'll remember also fun things like the gear that you got or just how, and I point that out to say, it felt like there was such a special time for the women's basketball players, all eyes on us. Um, and one thing I remember too, though, was my the last one, my senior year. And we lost to UConn in the championship in 2010 in, uh, I want to in Texas and San Antonio. And I remember leaving the court and crying so hard because I knew for me, I was probably done with my career in a big way, basketball wise. So it's also a reminder of how finite um, this opportunity is to play in the tournament, to play ball. Not all of these women will go on to be pros. And this is a really special moment in time to seize for them during March Madness. 
Well, Roz, you've been winning ever since, girl, so you are all good, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us and for breaking down the Pac-12 with us. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right, let's get some more highlights in this thing from the Greensboro region. 10 seed Creighton taking on 7 seed Colorado. And the story of the first half was a hot start by Colorado guard Jalen Sherrod. And here's the thing. This girl went absolutely off, 11 points in the half, and 27 for the entire game. But, T, I know that you had Creighton coming out of this matchup. Why is that? I had Creighton coming out of this matchup, not necessarily for Creighton, but because I didn't fully trust Colorado. And I, and I specifically asked Roz about Colorado, and she gave me this wonderful soliloquy of why we should. But unfortunately, I was feeling Creighton. Alexa, she convinced me too. Okay. Yeah, well, Creighton, I've watched them play in the Big East, having covered them, and they're just a really tough team to defend. Their uh -huh. offense is just like a lot of movement. It's kind of confusing, so it doesn't shock me that even a good defensive team like Colorado has some issues. So they win that one by 10. Uh, let's take a look at picks that you, the fans, made on ESPN's Women's Tournament Challenge. You guys picked South Carolina as the overwhelming favorites to win it all this year. For more insight on the bracket, here's my friend, Joe Fortenball, and a hater, Dallin Cuff. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Welcome to Las Vegas, the city of dreams, where you got to stay hydrated. This is a four-day marathon of college basketball games. If I'd have known Christine was hosting this thing, I'd have been out. I mean, you've been just been <laughs> hating on me. This is right away. She's taking shots because Kentucky, like everybody else didn't have Kentucky. And on top of that, my bets have been getting mauled. It was a rough first day, and I got you piling on. Dallin Cuff does not speak for both of us, Christine. I want to make that very, very clear. Joe said the exact opposite earlier. Really. So I don't like her either. So I know. Women's tournament round of 64 starts tonight. Let's begin by taking a look at the most popular picks to win it all when it comes to the bracket challenge. And what do you know? South Carolina cut checking in at 30%, followed by one seed Stanford, 12.5%. UConn at 11%. That's your two seed ahead of both NC State and Louisville. Now, that is the most popular picks, but how does it stack up? compared to ESPN's BPI metric in terms of chances to win the tournament. Well, take a look at this, and you'll notice a few discrepancies. First and foremost, no UConn, but once again, Dallin Cuff, South Carolina finds themselves at the top of the chart. That's no surprise. What Don Staley's done with that program is absolutely ridiculous. Um, so they deserve to be there. And Aaliyah Boston's an absolute just a freight train. She's a dominant pre uh, presence. Stanford's coming off a national championship. Still have Cameron Brink and a lot of those stars. Um, nobody has repeated in the women's game for the last five years, though, since UConn did it, I think, in 2018. Uh, so this, I don't know if they're going to repeat. My, my favorite team here is NC State. Ooh, I like cool. NC State a lot. I mean, I covered them, obviously, ACC all the time, and ACC Network, be in their studios every Sunday watching them play and watching them ball. And they've got an, an elite post presence in Elisa Kunane, and they got a lot of uh, great, great shooters around her. Uh, they're plus 650, I believe, to win the title, so I like their numbers. Now, that said, to get out of their region, the Bridgeport region, which is in Connecticut, ah. they got to play the two-seed UConn. Now, Paige Beckers is not 100%, but that place is going to be wholeheartedly behind UConn, so that is a hard place to play to get out of the region. I still think they do it. I think they beat Stanford in the semifinals. I do think they cut down the nets, and they pay out. I am going to be taking that aforementioned UConn team. I'm going okay. to forego all the one seeds that are that popular. I'm going to go with UConn because while they are a two seed, I want you to take note that this team has been a freight train as of late. They're a two seed because they started slow this season. Eight and four out of the gate. They battled some injuries, but they got healthy. 17 and one to close the street season, as well as a 10 game winning streak. Pay attention to this too. Odds makers, not seeds. Odds makers are what you should be looking at. And while UConn may be a two seed, they do have the second best odds to cut down the nets, checking in at plus 350 behind only South Carolina at plus 160. UConn does make you nervous a little bit? They make me nervous because if Paige is, if Paige is her and Caitlin Clark are the two best player guards in the country without a doubt. Now, talking to the great Rebecca Lobo, she didn't think she's going to be fully healthy through no. the tournament, at least the beginning part of the tournament, but they're going to have time to grow into it. The women's tournament tends to be very chalky. One and two seeds usually following to form to get in Elite Eight, and then it's always been one seeds to win. I think the last two seed to win was like 10 or 11 years ago, so it's not common, but again, playing in the Bridgeport region helps them, but I think when they run into that NC State team, that NC State team also lost in the Sweet 16 last year. Salty. They went and won the regular season. <laughs> regular season, the ACC. Hadn't happened since 1990. Cut down the Nets in the ACC tournament. Mind you, this is with Louisville in there, too. Another one seed in that, you know, in that league. And then they go on now to this mission that they could have. And, Christine, just to reiterate again, he does not speak for both of us. And I do not like you. I love you, Dallin. It's perfectly fine. Time now for Coach's Corner, presented by Invesco QQQ, where we find out who Tariqa and Alexa think will reach 
the title game and take this beauty home. You're looking at the WBCA trophy presented by Invesco QQQ, which will be rewarded to the national champion of the NCAA Women's National Tournament. So this is obviously a big deal. Yeah. And we already know this is what they're playing for in general. So I'll start with UT. Who do you have winning it all? I have South Carolina. Oh, it's such a surprise. No, no <laughs> surprise whatsoever. But I do have them facing off against NC State in the tournament, a team that we haven't really talked a lot about. But I think that this team is a team that runs through Alyssa Kune. They're unselfish. She plays unselfish basketball. She's got them to a number one seed twice in a row. And I think that she and what she's able to do with NC State will put them in a position to be successful. But there's nothing that they have that can answer what South Carolina can bring. Aaliyah Boston, again, the most dominant the best player on the court anytime she's on the court. I, I can only see them losing if they are inconsistent. Other than that, the championship should be theirs for the taking. Alexa? So I also have South Carolina in my title game, but I actually have them going up against Stanford. And then this okay. would be a rematch of, of course, last year's national semifinal game that Stanford won on their way to winning the national championship. And also a rematch of the meeting that they both had in December where South Carolina got revenge. So who would win this game? I have to say, I'm giving a slight edge to Stanford because I think they have a little bit more balance and depth, and they have the three-point shooting that could really kind of rock South Carolina back on their heels. But I think it's going to be a tough one. I wouldn't be shocked if South Carolina comes away with it, but we'll have to see. All right, still to come today, Caitlin Clark has been must-see TV this season, and today at 4 Eastern on ESPN, you'll get your chance to watch the sharpshooter and two-seed Iowa take on 15th seed Illinois State. These are the other games that are on our family of networks. Also, I want to shout you out, T, because you mentioned NC State, and a lot of people haven't been mentioned in NC State, but they're a one seed. They're a one seed. We should be talking about them more. <laughs> we should be talking about them more. Well, guys, it was so great hanging out with you. I'm so glad you so. were in studio with us. It was Fun. great. Great talking to women, ho women's hoops. Thanks for watching Women's Tourney Tip-Off Live, presented by Invesco QQQ. Go watch all of the women's games right now. Go do that.